Good morning, good afternoon, wherever with this um, webinar finds you now. Uh, apologies for the slight delay in starting this webinar. We are having a few technical issues, um, but uh, I hope that we're able to resolve them for all of our speakers by the end of the webinar now. So uh, my name is Nadine McCormick. I'm with IUCN's Business and Biodiversity Program based out of Switzerland. And um, uh, today is uh, the sixth webinar in a series where we are um, exploring questions that have come up um, from different um, conservation organizations that we are working with to support them when engaging business. So today's theme is really around how do you use policy and all the levers that it offers as a way to influence business practices. Um, we're using the, our source of the case studies is Panorama Solutions. So in case you're not aware of this amazing wealth of resources, there's now actually, I think it's nearly near 600 solutions that have been provided across five different themes from protected areas, ecosystem-based adaptation, agriculture, uh, marine and coastal areas, and business engagement. And, and the business engagement theme, we have now also, uh, nearly 50 solutions that your peers have provided where they have worked and it's led to, um, uh, to action to change. And they're written in a way that I, they are usable afterwards with these building blocks that tell you the success factors of why they worked and how they can be replicated in your case. It's a big community effort. We, you know, IUCN is one of the partners, but there's a UN Environment, there's GIZ, Grid Arundel, Rare, and we've been supported by um, uh, the German government and also the, the French uh, development agencies as well. And so really, I just recommended whatever the questions that you're facing in your day-to-day -day challenges, um, go there, look keyword search, and I'm sure you'll find solutions that are relevant for you. Um, and um, yeah, basically, there's also a business engagement thematic community there as well. So we've got about nearly 50 solutions that are available there. And plus all the webinars that we've done before now are also available on the IUCN website. You can see I've got some links in the slides here now. And actually, you should all be able to download the slides from the call today and have the links embedded. So if you go to your panel, um, you should see a little uh, box that says handouts. And from there, you can actually download and click the slides. Um, and you should be able to download them. And then you still have the, um, the, the slides. Great. OK, and then moving on. So today's agenda. Um, so I'll just give you um, a short um, introduction to the to uh, and to hear who you all are as well. And then we'll have a first framing presentation um, from Lorena Martinez Hernandez from the ICE and Environmental Law Center. So she will help us set the scene in terms of the role of legal frameworks for engaging um, private actors in conservation. So it's really a snapshot. Of a, of a much more detailed course that the Environmental Law Center has put together previously as well. So that's really a 10 minutes, um, just a quick overview to frame what do we mean when we talk about different policy levers. And we'll have a chance for a quick Q&A with her afterwards. So if you've got any questions, you can use the questions channel uh, panel box to put your questions as we go. And then I'm super happy to then have two um, case studies that we're gonna uh, share today. So the first one is, um, is from Ghana, it's when Chopin was Ghana with Mauricio Owosuansa and Evan Sampani. And they're gonna talk about how they've helped set up um, voluntary partnerships agreements as a way to um, integrate a legal domestic lumber supply in Ghana as, and trying to um, um, eliminate um, illegal um, chainsaw operators. And then in a, in a similar frame, but you know, different sector in different country, uh, we're then hoping if we can resolve audio issues, to have Mike McCormack uh, from the Policy Forum in Guyana, um, who will talk about an experience that they've gone through also with WWF Guyana and how they've helped protect rivers through effective cooperation and collective governance, especially around artisanal um, sand and aggregate mining in Guyana. And then we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A with the presenters um, then again, and then a discussion, and then we are just uh, wrapping up and let you know what's gonna be coming up in the next webinars. So that's our agenda now, but I'd love to, to hear from you. Oh, sorry, first of all, so yeah, here are the pictures of our lovely speakers. And we could be using webcam, but actually just to make sure that everybody who's on this call is actually able to you know, maintain their bandwidth, 
we're not using webcams today. So actually, at least you can see um, the faces of our of our lovely presenters today, and also the contacts um, where available. Um, you can also download from the handout slide. Next slide. So over to you. So I see um, we've got about 27 uh, of you online, in addition to the five of the panel that we have available now. So I'm just going to start a little poll just to see where you are. And so let's start this first poll. So um, hopefully that's coming up on your screen now. So if you could just take a moment and just click whichever is the most relevant answer. I'm aware that some of you might straddle one or you know two or even three of these categories, but just let us know. So who are you? Um, just so we get a sense of who we have on the call today. So I see about um, two thirds of you have voted so far. I'd like to see a few more, please. We'll give you a few more seconds to vote. And then um, we shall close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. OK, so let's see. Um, on the call today, we have, um, well, as usual, as normally we would expect a large number of um, civil society organizations at the national level and a large number of international level organizations as well. Interestingly, nobody from government today, given that the theme is around government policy levers. So that is curious. And really interesting to see businesses and consultancies as well. And in the others, um, that's interesting. You could put in the, the, the questions box who, who you're with today. But no, really, you're all super welcome. And I think, as you'll see from Lorena's presentation, all of us have different roles to play in ensuring that policy can help be an effective lever for influencing business practices. Great. So let's get on to a second poll as well, please, just to have a sense of, you know, what is the experience that we have on the call today? So our second poll. Oh, actually, no, this is a fun one. I want to see like where you're sitting. This is always a fun one. I like to see the diversity on the call today. Um, but where are you sitting today? So let's see. We've had most of you voting there now. So we close that one and share with you here. So a large um, number of participants calling in from Europe. Um, and then, yeah, a lovely kind of grouping around the Americas, the Africa, and even Asia. You're up late as well in Asia. Thanks very much. And unfortunately, yeah, Oceania, we're never quite in the right time zone for Oceania. Maybe we need to do something about it another time. But, you know, this call has been recorded and you will receive the recording as well. And then one more to keep us going. So then the last poll. Um, so what is your experience so far with um, policy and legal frameworks and using them to influence business practices? And that just helps us kind of set the tone as well to know, um, uh, yeah, what, what level should we you know, be pitching um, when it comes to the discussion as well? So, I mean, maybe you've got like zero experience, you're not sure where you want to start, or maybe you've got a little bit of experience, but you want to actually scale it up a bit more. Actually, you have a lot of experience and actually maybe we should have you presenting maybe another time actually. So get in touch with the survey at the end or none of the above. So again, I see most of you have voted. I'll close it in three, two, one. Ah, perfect. Exactly what we're hoping. So really, those of you who have little experience, you're super welcome. Today, you're going to get a sense of what can be possible and think about in your own particular context what you would um, how you would like to build on the lessons that you hear today. Those of you who have a lot of experience, I'm actually assuming that some of our panelists that have presented that, but if, if you're not a panelist and you have a lot of experience, th these calls are really about sharing that experience. So use the survey um, link at the end of the webinar. Please let us know who you are and we'll reach out to you and see if we can also capture your experience through Panorama Solutions and potentially on another webinar. And those in the middle, the six, six to seven percent, you have a little experience and not sure how to scale it up, like, please have those situations and experiences in mind. Like, really, the view, the idea behind these webinars is to inspire you and empower you and give you the courage to go out and, you know, replicate some of the examples that you hear today. So, really, this call is for you. Okay. So, without further ado, um, let's um, get on with the rest of the presentations.
Just trying to find the right slide deck now. Sorry, bear with me, please. Okay, so we're about to get into the Sorry, you're not seeing the right slide deck. I was working perfectly before, sorry. Ah, phew, got it back. Okay, so we're about to hear um, um, from uh, Lorena in a minute, but just to say, as she goes through her presentation, Please don't, um, if you have a question that comes up, don't wait till the end. You can just put it in the questions box in your control panel um, on the on the right hand side there. So please, any questions that you have, even if it's just a technical question as well, um, just put them in the question box as we go along and then we give you a chance um, after the presentation to, to share your questions. So um, if we go to the next slide. So Lorena, um, you are up and um, let's just see if we can mute your microphone. Oh, hello. How Hi. are you? Well, I'm, I'm a bit frazzled, it seems, actually. Goodness. <laughs> I'm really glad I can hear your lad up there ready to take over. So yeah, Lorena, we didn't practice the, the slide switch, but if you just can say a little next, then I can pass on the slides for you as well, no problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So hello, everybody. I'm very happy to 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 have you here and um, and thank you to Nadine and Ella for inviting me to give this short presentation, this very, very short and brief uh, introduction to the role of law to engage private actors in conservation. Um, so uh, I think, well, Nadine has already said a little, uh, I think everybody knows now why it is important to go to the next, please. <laughs> why well, it's important to to engage business and so we're not i'm not gonna go there i'm just gonna start from the assumption that we all understand why but i do want to um to share with you what we are referring by public policy and um, we are in, in, at least in, in this presentation so we are referring to the series of governmental decisions that include processes activities and actions public policies in general, and we, we understand them in general, in the broad sense that includes law, the constitution, regulations, the legislation, international law, meaning treaties and customary law, and also soft law, which is um, um, a way that is not mandatory, but that helps to shape human conduct, which is the main objective of public policy, to shape human conduct to achieve uh, societal goals. So today we're going to talk about the public policies that encourage good social and environmental practices by business and other actors. Next, please. Next, uh, yeah. So for this end, there are different types of policies. Those that are um, a mandate policies, the, which establish what a private actor must do, those that are facilitative policies, which establish what a private actor can do, and those that, and those are endorsement policies, which establish what private actors should do, and they focus on raising awareness, uh, raising awareness, and engaging different actors uh, and uh, and partnering as well. Next, please. So. Um, these kind of policies are then uh, expressed or can use make use of different mechanisms and tools, which typically are command and control, which refer to direct um, direct uh, regulation, economic mechanisms, and some kind of new policy tools that include collaboratory approaches and as well as soft uh, standards and certification mechanism, mechanisms. Their difference lays mostly on the objective that they have and the strength of their regulatory of, of, of the, the strength of its regulation. So command and control are the strongest ones, and the, and the new policy tools are the softer ones. Next, please. This um, so the command and control are 
are what we usually understand by 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 law or by legislation so they establish an obligation for uh, private actors to do something or, or to refrain to from taking certain activity that has a significant impacts on the environment or to do an activity if they allow uh, private actors to do an activity but if and only if they follow specific conditions so one example of that is let's say a mining um, company that wants to exploit a mine they first need to ask for an environmental permit and this environmental permit um, can or mostly most of the times they include some mitigation measures which could mean uh, reforestation or something so in in order to do something the private actor has to mandatorily do something for conservation these these mechanisms set minimum standards and they are arguably the most effective for conservation the problem with them is that they depend on the political will of the governments to regulate and also to enforce the regulation and it is also criticized because it it said that they have no or they provide no incentives to go beyond compliance with the existing regulations so next please so the next kind of um, mechanisms are the economic ones which try to align or realign incentives uh, to discourage environmentally harmful activities on the one side or to encourage and reward business or good good practices business good practices and they can be uh, they can refer to uh, broad based economic instruments or they can refer to one specific sector or they can go to or they can be more tailored uh, like subsidies are to support certain supply side uh, incentives next please mm, one example of this are the it's uh, our licenses um, so for example in 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 ireland in 2007 they doubled the price of uh, salmon fishing licenses both for recreational purposes and for commercial purposes the revenues that the government gained from this from these licenses were used to fund conservation projects and in the end after 10 years of implementation they knew or they realized that they had very good positive um, uh, biodiversity and habitat impacts especially they managed to stabilize uh, salmon stocks they improved the status of river banks and they managed to restore riparian zones next please um, next <laughs> yeah so in the last mechanisms we have um, stand standards certifications and public private partnerships um, these this can this is a world in itself and we could dedicate a whole webinar on on talking about them um they're from different kinds different levels different uh sectors so for example we have international or global standards like for example the global the un global compact um we have also financial uh, institutions that have policies of environmental and social safeguards or that they have uh, certain criteria for uh, environmental criteria for uh, for granting or financing projects there are also guidelines that multinational enterprises should follow like for example the ones of the OECD that uh, establish some principles that um, environment that um, any multinational uh, enterprise should should follow um and there are also that are sector specific like they're in forest on or uh, or on or on agriculture um and um and there are others that are national certificates or standards what these have in common is that they are voluntary by nature and that they and because of that they cannot be enforced they are actually controlled mostly through society or through the public uh yeah, the the public the civil society who are um overseeing asking for information um and they um through this through these tools the enterprises um show or provide information of what they are doing and what uh, impacts they are they are having the 
let's say the backlash of, of this or maybe their, their weaknesses is that if there is no uh, search, well, if there is no trusted um, uh, authority or, or organ who can uh, verify this uh, or the information that these uh, enterprises are, are providing, it could give some space for greenwashing, which is not always the case, certainly. But um, the, the, there, there should be some kind of or, or some kind of um, uh, complementarity between the different tools. So next, please. So one one example of the uh, of these tools are, and I'm really sure you you all know them are the Forest Stewardship Council. And I'm sure you've seen this logo in. Uh, maybe a publication, a book, or or something. So what they what they do is a, this is a certification that ensures that the products come from responsibly managed. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. From responsibly uh, managed forests, um, and they make sure that these products uh, follow the standards throughout the whole uh, supply chain. They um, include stakeholder participation and stakeholder reporting. Um, and, um, and yeah, next, please. But as I was, next, please. But as I was saying, um, none of these policy mechanisms can be, can or should work in isolation. They need to be carefully drafted and, and, and integrated in order to achieve the maximum um possibility of engaging private actors in in conservation and they can they also cannot work on i mean alone they they need of a strong civil society therefore they should be accompanied by other endorsement policies uh, that try to raise awareness of the of the people so next please <laughs> um so as we see these different uh, mechanisms, the, we also see that there are changing roles for the, for the um, uh, different actors. Uh, on the one hand, the state role is shrinking or, or changing uh, from being uh, the only rule maker and definer to be the only rule maker and enforce, enforcer to be also a, a definer, the, the one that defines goals and norms, uh, to be a, the regulate, a regulator, to be a funder by providing funding for investments, like for example, as I said in the in the example of the light of the licenses, fishing licenses, uh, the revenues uh, the revenues need to be managed and many times it's through funds, um, managed and directed to, to conservation and also as an enabler um, that encourage and facilitate processes of voluntary action and also uh, of public-private partnerships or collaborative um, uh, mechanisms, which we will hear later of. Uh, and, um, and also the, the civil society role is changing from being only a rule taker to be a citizen and rule maker through increased participation. So it's a rule maker as a, as, a, um, as an, yeah, because it's um, getting more engaged through direct participation um, and not only representative, um, not only representative democracy, democracy, but also participatory democracy to be an agent of change and a consumer, meaning uh, when the, the, um, the civil society decides what uh, to choose a certified product over another, it's having also this agent, this, this role of agent or consumer, um, a watchdog, because uh, the civil society is or should be uh, demanding for information and also demand, the, denouncing illegal activities, which is happening uh, a lot, and and is taking the role of a partner. And um, well, so if we bring all this together, next, please. So what could, um, oh yeah, for building building capacities. Um, so because of this role of, of civil society, we are also working a lot on building capacities on what is 
on what is law and to improve the understanding um, and um, and the capacities of, of civil society to do lobbying or to advise and and and, in, and better interact or negotiate with businesses and governance and governments. Uh, so there there is a link of uh, of a webinars of, or a series of webinars that we have online. And well, basically that's uh, what I wanted to share with you. So if we can just make some conclusions, um, I, I mean, I would say that uh, there is a wide array of public policies that can be scaled up. And we're not talking about direct regulation. So when we, when we talk about public policies, it's not only uh, the very first command and control as we had understood, um, previously. Mm. <laughs> the other ones, <laughs> thank you. That um, all these this policies can bring many benefits. Uh, they can bring benefits of like in the kind of environmental. When you have a policy it, and, and it's not only on a case by case basis, but you are scaling up, you can have a better landscape approach, um, especially when you refer to, to uh, mechanisms such as offsetting. Um, there are also social benefits uh, that refer to access and, and distribution of uh, or uh, of benefits um, and also of burdens and the economic benefits that that come from uh, from these policies. Um, but in order to make them work, they 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 should be uh, they should be carefully designed and monitored. Uh, because actually one of the main uh, problems with uh, the economic mechanisms is that they depend a lot on on the information and on on being monitored uh, about their effectiveness um, and about the that that their their costs are carefully designed mm. otherwise they could actually have a, a negative effect like for example, if we do not monitor, if we have a, a carbon trade, if we do not monitor um, very carefully the amount of, uh, of certificates that are there, um, we or we could have more emissions than the ones that we are trying actually to, to limit. So this cap and trade uh, could be somehow erased. Um, and yeah, and therefore there is also a high need uh, for to enhance transparency mechanisms and and to empower local communities. So um, for states or for government actors, a recommendation would be to strengthen and guarantee uh, participatory environmental mm -hmm. rights and to establish quasi-judicial or alternative uh, oversight mechanisms, like for example ombudsman, um, which uh, the World Bank has something similar. Mm, yeah. For the civil society is to know and use rights, to choose dialogue, to uh, to try to engage more with uh, with the private sector and, um, and for the private actors to to embrace these opportunities, to build stronger networks with uh, local communities, and also to to innovate, to try to be innovative on this. Um, Thank you very much. I think this is all um, what I'm going to share with you. Super. Thank you so much, Lorena, for taking this Mission Impossible to give us a short and, you know, very simple um, overview of uh, what we mean when we look at legal policies and, uh, and levers. And uh, you've done such a great job because I know lawyers do like your technical language, but I thought you did a very, really clear presentation. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, <laughs> Yeah. people to um to ask some questions to Lorena now already I didn't see any questions coming into the chat box far just ones around um being able to download the slides so maybe just to clarify again hopefully this should be below the the questions box there should be a part where it says the down uh, handouts and then you should be able to download the slides so if you can't then I'll need to find a way of emailing them to you afterwards but uh, let me know but are do we have any questions for Lorena um, at the moment now is the time to just type them in the chat box. We'll also have a chance to have a discussion at the end as well. Um, and I really, I mean, I appreciated the points you were saying around the role of civil society, especially, I mean, that's really why 
one of the main objectives we hold these calls actually is really to help inform especially you know the conservation community the different roles that they can play and it doesn't always have to be you know you know aggressive campaigning with the press but um um but um you know there are other ways of actually supporting and being this watchdog role that doesn't have to be so negative and so actually we're looking forward to the um the case study now we're going to get from ghana so we don't see um any questions so far which clearly means you did an amazing job lorena thank you <laughs> uh, thank but yeah but, but you know but you'll be on the on the call anyway yeah. at the end so yes just... i will be at any time if there's another question i will be here during the whole yeah okay Super, great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, hang on a minute. There is a couple of questions that come in right just at the end. So, hey, Louise Johnson. Hi, nice to see you. So, do you have a good example where a developer has not taken into account valid civil society and has suffered consequences? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, just Could, your... I, I cannot see it. Could you repeat the question? Because I couldn't, I couldn't so, see it here. Yeah, okay, no worries. It's so um do you have an example of where a developer did not uh -huh. take into account valid civil society and therefore they suffered consequences? <laughs> That's a good question. Yes, there yeah, are many examples. <laughs> many yeah. examples. Yeah. Um well um I don't know if I would like to mention one specific case, but um but I could mention that, for example, uh, there are many cases in the Inter-American uh, uh, Commission, la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, okay. where um, there have been uh, participatory uh, processes, but where the comments of the of the of the public were not taken into account. Or even where the the, the rights of indigenous peoples um, to their lands were not taken into account, and then they are taken to um, to first to the national courts to demand for for um, for a justification of why they were not taken into account, and um, and after the national um, jurisdictions, they could reach the Inter-American Court of, of Justice. One of those is this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the name right now of the case. But OK. But also, um, there are several cases in the um, in the World Bank, in the CAL, um, where the, yeah, where there have not been taken into account the comments of the of the society, and then there are uh, some measures to try to to compensate for that. Um, but I would I would be happy to send you links and specific cases um, if you want to. Um, at the moment, I can't remember the names. No worries. No, I think you're right. And actually, there's, I'm trying to think also at the top of my head. There's a statistic that says um, uh, in the World Bank, um, uh, like half of projects are delayed or something. And, and typically some of the delays are linked to natural resources, natural resource governance issues or something like that. So again, I need to dig out that statistic as well. But I think, yeah, there's a few. Maybe we could put them together and add maybe a slide to the deck and then share it with everybody. But um, yeah, OK. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Good. So I just experimented. I just see if I could actually change the um, um, see if I could share that question with everybody there and the answer. Super, thanks. Um, and then there was another question actually. Um, hey Olivier, um, it's just asking. So in terms of the UN post 2020 biodiversity framework, like what type of policy would you consider that to be? Hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah um i think going more towards the the facilitative um policies um but uh, but i think um there should be more a mix of of them 
I'm not saying that all of uh, that that all the targets should be tried to accomplish through um, through command and control, but uh, there should be um, a more balanced one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah. certainly we're seeing companies look, looking forward to this biodiversity, biodiversity framework as a way to help guide um, and offer like a north star to their corporate actions as well. If they could have some overall target, then they would know more what actions they should do and not do and what to monitor as well. But I guess you're right, it's more on that facilitative side. Yeah, super. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Adrian Linden, this is your last question and I let you off the hook. <laughs> so some of the new tools or standards like the IFC Performance Standard 6, can they be considered mm -hmm. command and control types, um, especially when the project requires a loan from the lender? So, you know, it's an obligation then, it's not voluntary, is that correct? So something like an IFC performance standard, is that a, would you see it as a command and control type of policy? Well, I would just say that they have different strength, but I wouldn't call it as a command and control specifically, basically because, uh, because there is no state actor directly involved there um, yeah. to enforce them. So they have uh, they have mechanisms that make well it has mechanisms that make it stronger, but not necessarily uh, through the use of the of the state powers. Yeah. yeah. Super. Okay. All right. Let, let me let you off the hook then, Lorena, and uh, we're going to open up now to to Mercy and um, to Evans um, in Ghana. So let's see. Um, I see that you're on there. Hey, Mercy. Hey, Evans. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay, so can we start now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so um, we are sharing um, our experience with um, how we supported the integration of legal and legitimate domestic lumber supply through the voluntary partnership agreement. And then, so when Ghana signed on onto the voluntary partnership agreement, um, we made some commitment that we were going to supply legal lumber to um, EU but also we were going to ensure that in the domestic market there is also legal lumber and that is uh, the background to this particular story that we are presenting and so in Ghana um, chainsaw lumber is illegal and it has been banned by law uh, because it was considered as one of the greatest um, factors that caused deforestation and forest degradation. And uh, beyond that, chainsaw operators benefited from illegal logging, but it risks um, government sanction. So when a chainsaw operator is caught, there are several laws that um, go against them. But the act itself is considered um, criminal because um, it results in killing um, on both sides, so some chainsaw operators are killed in there in, in, when laws are being enforced, but also government officials who are responsible for um, enforcing the laws also get um, themselves killed in the process. So several factors, uh, one of them is the fact that the state loses a lot of revenues because of illegal chainsaw operations. Um, Ivan, what else is there as um, the issue? So there, <clears throat> there are some challenges uh, to the issue, and uh, the major one is uh, weak law enforcement. Um, already there is a ban on uh, illegal chainsaw milling activities, and there is a law which 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 sees that uh, such operations are not carried out, but the enforcement on, of the law 
is also another issue because uh, there are some challenges in the law, uh, especially some of the sector policies are not well coordinated and that is making the enforcement of the law somehow uh, difficult. There is also high rate of uh, unemployment. So people uh, living close to the forest see illegal chainsaw milling as an avenue for, for them to engage in economic activities. Uh, there is also poor domestic lumber supply standards. The standards on the uh, domestic market is, is nothing to write home about. So uh, there is a vacuum for these illegal chainsaw operators to fill and then uh, uh, supply for the domestic market. I think Messi will continue with so, the solution. Um, yes, yeah, so um, what we did was that um, for this particular program, we were trying to develop viable and alternative options for um, illegal logging through implementation of a multi-stakeholder dialogue. And what it means is that we will try to bring all the actors together so that we can think about um, a solution to make sure that while um, laws are being enforced, the issue of unemployment is also um, being addressed. And then um, issues around uh, supplying or providing standards for um, domestic lumber is being developed and designed while at the same time the sector policies are well coordinated. So we did all this through a multi-stakeholder dialogue where all the actors were brought together to discuss the issues, identifying the problem and looking at what's, um, what were the pros and cons of, of, the, of the problem and then also trying to find solutions to these um, problems. We also, um, as a solution, equip forest um, community to undertake these alternative livelihoods. So that um, that was going to address the high unemployment rates in the, in, the, in the communities where we were piloting this particular um, program in. Can we go to the next slide? Evan. Okay, so what has been the impact of our intervention? Uh, what we are saying is that uh, out of this project, we've been able to uh, support uh, illegal things operators to transform, to do uh, legal businesses where they are able to hook onto the voluntary partnership agreement not just uh, the illegal chains operators transforming to do legal business, but also uh, former loggers are also uh, trying to do le legal activities because they are supposed to also adhere to all the EU regulations in terms of uh, exporting their products to the EU market. So we've been able to do that. That is one of the impacts. Um, there is also another impact where uh, former loggers, that is illegal chainsaw operators, going into reforestation areas where they've already degraded it. Uh, they are trying to support us to bring the forest back where we've allocated uh, degraded areas within the forest reserve to this former illegal chainsaw operators to restore it. Uh, the, the MSD process, which is the multi-stakeholder process, has also contributed very well to developing a, a domestic market lumber supply policy, well, which takes into consideration all the processes and the strategies to make sure that uh, there is legal lumber on the domestic market of Ghana. So this is very interesting because uh, before this intervention from Tropping Boss Ghana, uh, hardly will you see all these actors coming together to discuss uh, domestic market issues or illegal issues. So um, each party sat at their own position. So they held on to their position and they thought there was no need for any discussion. So chainsaw operators were doing their things and then um, they were being um, chased by um, the Forestry Commission, which is the mandatory organization 
to 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 um, enforce um, the laws, and then the chains of oppressors also sat in their corner. But one of the greatest impacts for of, of our of our program was the fact that we brought them together to a table so that they can all discuss the issues and then find joint solutions to these um, issues, which is all, all causing deforestation in, in the country. Can we go to the next slide, please? So on the building blocks, um, in summary, what we will say on the building blocks is that um, when the fact that we created awareness and then we provided strong incentives for engagements. We also also provided empirical data on um, the, the, the status of the of the chains of operation, and then we presented the true picture from the empirical data that look, we are trying to 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 regulate chains of operation, but it is supplying the domestic market at that time to the tune of about 84% of the local market was provided from these illegal activities. So there was the real need for, for, for the two main actors to, to come together and discuss the issue. Again, the use of the multi-stakeholder dialogue was very, very important because it, it resulted in um, co-development of um, alternatives. So, each of the of the of the actors um, found themselves owning the process and then also developing the alternatives together. Uh, it provided options for logging, and then it resolved several conflicts that was there for um, since the the, the chainsaw um, operation was out, outlawed. And then it also brought about enabling policy change for sustainability. And at this program, two key policies were, were drafted. Uh, the one, one that uh, was looking at um, how we can supply the domestic market with legal lumber. And then one that is also trying to promote a public procurement policy for government um, um, contractors who are using chainsaw lumber to, to do government pro pro projects. So in the end, a combination of the first and the second um, building block was that raising awareness provided information of stakeholders' interests, uh, which allowed them to form tighter and more effective bonds in the uh, multi-stakeholder platform. Because a lot of the um, policies, a lot of the engagements were done in this multi-stakeholder platforms. And that informed a lot of the decisions that were being taken by both parties, the chains of operators, and then also the governments um, at, at um, different sides of the table. Yeah, next slide. So the lessons here are that uh, now there is greater recognition of the MSD process as a participatory mechanism in policy processes in the forestry sector of Ghana because we see the MSD process as a, as a means of bringing all the parties together and then discuss the issues and then bring out the policy strategies uh, moving forward. Um, there is also a, a domestic um, market policy in place that supports the supply of legal lumber to the domestic market in Ghana. And also uh, stakeholders within the domestic markets are now better off well organized because they've gained some capacities and now they are able to engage uh, state actors and then uh, they are able to represent themselves very well. There is also a, a recognition of a domestic market issue within the flag BPA process and then the, the national discourse in terms of our red class issues in Ghana. So relating it to, um, relating it to uh, the first speaker's um, presentation, where um, she was suggesting that um, policies should be carefully designed and monitored. And one of the key lessons is that when you bring stakeholders to, to together and they, are, um, they have the same or common understanding, they will be able to develop very useful policies and laws that um, are owned by all these stakeholders rather than them seeing it as coming from either the law enforcers or from the other side of the tables but once they do it together they own it together some recommendations from our um, program is that when we utilize multi-stakeholder 
platform, we are able to make policy decisions that each of the stakeholders would adhere to and then make sure that they are committed to because they did it together. There, there should be continual uh, uh, awareness creation because we just did this in some pilot areas. And um, even though it has been very successful, and now chainsaw operators, uh, once chainsaw operators has been transformed to, to, to provide legal lumber, we uh, expect that it will be rolled out in the, in, in the country. Now, we also yeah. think that police enforcement uh, on the ban of illegal chainsaw mailing should, should continue, but it should be done in a proper way and a proper manner where there should be discussions uh, among mm -hmm. all the stakeholders. And then we should pursue the development of alternative livelihood for those who cannot afford to move into the login options that have been provided under our program. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I love the double act, Mercy and Evans. It just was perfect. It worked really well and such a fantastic case study to illustrate some of the lessons that Lorena shared with us in the, in the previous presentation. So thanks for making those links there, uh, Mercy, in terms of the importance of designing policies together with different stakeholders. So there's an understanding and a buy-in and really you played such a critical role in that an important role of civil society organizations. And I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't easy, but you made it sound easy, right? So hopefully you've inspired others on the call to also uh, <laughs> think about that. So um, I I'm gonna ask people to put their questions in the Q&A box now as well. So normally um, we were gonna have a second present, uh, a third, sorry, presentation now from Guiana. As you can see, I've let time run knowing that we couldn't resolve the technical issues. Um, so we might need to find another way of bringing them in, but there was a brilliant story from the policy forum in the Guiana a little bit similar to what you're talking about, but you know the impacts of uh, illegal, in this case, um, gold uh, mining. And uh, you know what they simply did was they did a press release. The Ministry of Natural Resources said, "Oh, actually, we appreciate this. Thank you for your vigilance." And then they did a rapid assessment and then put in place a commission, which has then um, um, <clears throat> um, put in a way to manage all the mining licenses. And um, and now there's actually an agreement and they've got actually more legal mining happening in that river and this sorted out the river. So that is a really a poor justice to this amazing case study that was going to be presented. But let's see if we can find another way to bring it back and also we'll make it available on Panorama Solutions. Um, but they had similar lessons in terms of, you know, like you need to do it with others, create that space for others to collaborate and come together and, you know, pick your timing as well. Actually, you know, there was an opportunity with a law that was being discussed they went in and made their press statement and you know that was a good timing so uh really very it would have been some very similar examples but um but yeah so let's see if you've got any questions for um um for mercy and evans just before we wrap up the call at the end of the day maybe just while we're waiting for you to formulate your questions in the in the question box again lorena can i kind of put you on the spot a little bit and just maybe get you to also respond to what you've just heard now um with Mercy and Evan's presentation, probably you know illustrating a lot of what you were saying earlier on. Is there anything that you would like to you know add and and, and build onto that? Um, so you're muted if you yeah. do like to say something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, that I can so hear you. I was yeah. very impressed, and I loved this example um, specifically because it refers on how to, how to turn a at let's say a difficult situation, a big challenge that has many um, faces. So it's not looking at um, that has many faces into something positive and that led to a buy-in from many different stakeholders. So what I'm what what I see in the in one of the big values of this uh, new tools, meaning the collaborative approaches is that they allow for understanding a problem um, as um, or, or an issue, a challenge from all its um, um, aspects. Meaning yeah. you, if, you if you look only at the command and control, um, you could have said, oh, I'm just going to forbid logging. And, but logging was already forbidden, right? Um, and there was lack of, of enforcement, but that was not solving all the other problems uh, that were uh, facing the communities. So um, that's that's why um, collaborative options have, uh, or collaborative uh, tools 
uh, can be much more, um, let's say, comprehensive. And that's why the different tools need to be yeah. um, carefully, uh, you know, they, they need to act as a system. Um, they need yeah. to be compre uh, comprehensive, like articulated one with another. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's okay. and that's why it's also so important that they could even bring it to uh, to to developing policies on procurement on on, on public yeah. procurement. I was very very impressed, and I think it's a beautiful beautiful example. Here, here, I agree. And actually, yes, our colleague Leanne also agrees, and she's just wondering. So, Mercy and Evans. Like, have you been able to replicate this example, you know, perhaps elsewhere in Ghana or in the region or through Top and Bus International's network? Um, it seems to be a fantastic example. So, yeah, has there been any replication of it? Um, so, um, this particular program, when we were doing it, it's, we did it together with Guyana. So, they had um, a similar issue of illegal chain solving. And uh, through this program, they were all also able to do some, uh, bring in some regu regulation and sanity into uh, the, the chainsawing. The interesting thing about the Guyana and then the Ghana case was that while in Ghana, um, chainsawing was banned, in Guyana, it was not banned. So we were picking lessons from the two countries. And see that, yes, uh, then learning how the Guyana situation can, can be um, replicated in, in, in Ghana. One of the things mm -hmm. that was a, a, a problem was the fact that in Guyana, they still had a lot of forests. But in Ghana, um, we were depleting our forest resources. So you wouldn't be able to take all the case from Guyana to Ghana. But what are the good things that can be brought? And one of them was um, for people to form um, artisanal mailing associations so that um, instead of um, every chainsaw operator taking their their, their their chainsaw to go to the forest, they form an artisanal milling um, um, association by um, um, machines that are able to have higher recovery rates than the chainsaw, and then they do their business mm -hmm. as an association rather than as individuals. So these are some of the things that we pick. Now being replicated in Ghana, yes, a lot of um, chainsaw operations have now upgraded to artisanal milling. So you right. find that uh, although there are still some chainsaw lumber in the market, it has reduced very significantly. Uh, a recent study reported that um, now we have more than 50% of our um, domestic lumber um, from um, improved so from artisanal mills. So it means that when we started at 84% um, of illegal lumber, through this intervention and others now, there, there are reports that state that uh, we have more than 54, more than 50% of our lumber coming from legal sources. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, really great. No, and it's, I love the irony that it, the other case was in Guyana, and that's the country we couldn't get onto the call today. But uh, yeah, no, thanks again. So actually, I'm aware of the time. It's gone a couple of minutes over the hour. We did start late. I see that some people have left already, but those of you who are still here, and if you don't need to rush away, I did want to show you just a couple um, more slides. Um, so basically, the, the example that um, Mercy and Evans presented is on Panorama Solutions. If you go to the website and you just go into the keyword search box, search for Ghana, there's probably, I think, eight or something examples there, and you'll easily find the one that Top and Boss Ghana presented today. There's also loads of other ones that we could have presented, and Mamadou um, uh, and in, from Burkina Faso, I see was on the call as well. Actually, we just managed to get his case study up online today. It's in French. But in a similar way, talked about how they mobilize civil society organizations to get mining companies to comply with some of the, the tax um, uh, regulations there. Again, by informing the government, uh, the, the level, uh, the implementation rate that was low, the government was like, yeah, that's not good. And they took action. So I'm not saying it's simple, but it is possible if you dare to have the courage to kind of speak up and, you know, play that kind of watchdog and kind of validation role. There's another really Nice example as well from WWF Indonesia that we would have loved to have, have spoken today. Um, but uh, yeah, they, you know, they were going to have internet issues uh, working from home at the moment. But again, a lovely, great example um, looking again around that community, community participation, getting the community to understand the laws and that they could then um, perform that watchdog role 
and um, and then help actually create a larger number of legal um, uh, gold extraction again in, in Indonesia. And then also another, actually there's quite a lot related to mining, isn't there? And another nice one from Mongolia as well. So say just another shout that on, on Panorama, there's more than 50 case studies now that relate to business engagement. And so, yeah, if you are looking to, you know, influence business practices either directly or indirectly, you'll find something in there that will be helpful and, and a contact that you could also reach out directly to and ask for support. Um, so as we wrap up now, um, I don't see any hands raised or anything at the moment uh, for final questions, but um, that when you close the webinar, there will be a webinar survey and in the link, and it just helps us so much if you're able just to spend, it's literally two minutes, give us some feedback. I know the start was a bit dodgy, <laughs> uh, but thank you for your patience and getting to the end now. So do fill in the survey. Also use that survey to let us know if you would like to share your experiences through a Panorama solution and a future webinar, we'd really love to reach out to you. And then the next webinar we're planning to hold in another three months time is currently June um, 25th, Thursday, so same time, June 25th. One of the things we've heard around questions around um, businesses just beginning to wake up. They're doing CSR, but they're just doing schools. They're just, you know, investing in communities. How can we help them invest more in uh, the environmental issues in their community? So this is like CSR plus for countries, especially at the beginning of their um, sustainability journey. And then we've seen that business and biodiversity type networks are a fantastic way of raising that awareness with companies in a safe space. So how have different networks and civil society organizations done that? Um, so we've pulled together some really great learnings from across Asia, Africa, Europe, and others. So we're potentially going to do the next call on that. If you've got experience on that, let us know through the survey and we can reach out to you as well. And then finally, just a shout out that um, next week um, there should have been um, the African Forum on Green Economy in Uganda. Um, that's gone online now um, with all the, the coronavirus. And they've really innovated here to try to make it as accessible as possible from uh, countries with lower bandwidth. And so a combination of um, YouTube live webinars, um, uh, web chats, and um, a couple of Zoom webinars, you can join in for different sessions. So there's a general framing, there's water, there's infrastructure, there's agriculture. Um, in, and um, and then taking action and going forward and also links to development finance. So that's really, uh, yeah, it's a great team that's put it together and um, yeah, I encourage you to kind of sign up for that as well. And then and then finally, that's our last word, just to say thank you for making it this far to the end of the, the webinar, the last 21 of us on the call here now. We peaked, I think, at like over, over 30. So no, I really appreciate your time for joining us today. Um, please do fill in the survey. And then we'll see you in um, three months time. So thank you. Have a good rest of the day, wherever you are. And a big thank you finally again to, um, to our presenters, to um, Lorena, to Mercy, to Evans, and also a huge thank you to Ella and Leanne for also helping in the background, our IUCN colleagues. And apologies to our Ghana colleagues, Guiana, sorry, Guiana colleagues, we'll get you next time. So thank you. Have a great rest of your day and uh, talk to you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau.